Mr. Donardo. How are you doing, sir? Hey, I'm just happy you invited this jag off back to the show. <laughs> yes. Yes. <laughs> What's that about? Well, it's your I come fault. and listen to your show, and like 13 seconds in, I find out I'm a jag off. <laughs> wow. By my friend down here. This your friend down there called you something worse, just so you know. Well, yeah, I mean, that's, that's your it also is true. Welcome to another episode of the Donut Bag, part of the Pulse Podcast Network and the Pod Hub Network. In this episode, I talked to Leah Blasco from the Pens blog about the Penguins' recent struggles. Then I talked to Anthony DiNardo from North Shore 9 about the recent Pirates trade and what they should do in the offseason. And I talked to Dan Greenwald from Comic Book Pit about Stan Lee and his impact on comic books. As always, please subscribe or follow wherever you listen to the podcast. And if you do that already, thanks a lot. The Donut Bag starts right now. Okay, big news going on with the Penguins. With me to talk about it is Leah Blasco. She is at Sia Leah on Twitter, and she is a writer for the Pens blog. Leah, how you doing? Oh, I'm doing well. I'm I'm really excited, actually. Um, The Penguins did all the things today. It's like they had a checklist, and they just went check. Check, check. All right. So what's so so I'm guessing you were happy with the uh with the trade Carl Haglin for Tanner Pearson um uh, to from the Kings. What yeah. do you think about that trade? So my my gut reaction is of course I'm gonna miss Carl. Carl was a very important part of this team when they won the back to back cups. But since then it hasn't really been working and he's on an expiring deal and the penguins were able to move him for a guy who's cost controlled and younger, which makes the Kings look real dumb. Like to Why me, did quite they do frank. that? <laughs> I Wait, don't know. You trade a guy who's about to be, who's a, who's a, a, a free agent after this year for a guy that's under control for what, two or three more years or something like that. Now, the the thing is, of course, it could be because they're planning to, like, maybe make a big splash in free agency. Maybe they're planning to completely tank and just, like, if this doesn't make sense. But the Kings are a lot like, no, the Kings think they're a lot like the Penguins in that they need a roster shakeup and it's going to make their team better. It's not because their team isn't very good, but they think that. And so... That's probably why they agreed to the one-to-one nature because I don't, I don't see how this is a bad move for the Penguins. Tanner Pearson hasn't really scored this year, but he still has, um, he's a 93.33 PDO, which means he's underperforming. So he'll, that should even out. And he has a, he has fantastic possession numbers and he's under control and he's young. These are all things that really tick boxes that Jim Rutherford looks for in these kinds of trades. Was Haglin more of a sentimental? I mean, I'm, I'm sure, uh, you know, his speed will be missed. Um, his penalty, kill, penalty killing will be missed. But was this more of a sentimental move? I mean, because he really does not put up great numbers. Um, He puts up good numbers on the back half. And in 2016, he was vital in that capital series. So I wouldn't call it a sentimental move. I would say that when they acquired him, they intended on keeping him until the end of his deal and then just letting it run out. Because he was being, in my opinion, probably overpaid. And so them making this move, I don't think that it's so much like sentimental or this. It's it's to send a message. This sends Mm -hmm. a message to that team, like, get your shit together. Or things will be changing. Uh, you know, 
they another thing the Penguins did today was extend Jim Rutherford. Uh, and they extended his contract, and uh, well, are you are you happy with that? So, I feel ambivalent because most of the time when people sign these kinds of deals, does it really matter? Most, like, I feel like 85% of these deals don't go to completion anyways, whether it's a GM, whether it's a, whether it's a coach, like, we just, the track record is not there that a coach just plays to the end, like, coaches until the end of their contract and then leaves. What happened with Mike Babcock was so rare in that that's exactly how it played out. Yeah, but (laughs) the thing I like about it, I don't know if it's because He's older. I mean, he is he is 69, but he basically says whatever's on his mind. Um, last week, he just ripped into the team and he basically said, if you don't start, if, if we don't start seeing something, people are going to be gone. And then he does. And then he makes this trade today. Yeah, no. I, the thing is with Jim Rutherford, he's not afraid to call his shot and then follow through. He's just not. He's at that age where he gives zero. He does not care. He, like, he wants to win, and he wants his team to be successful, and he knows that they have the most essential pieces to be successful. They have the Crosby, they have Malkin, they have, you know, they have all of those big pieces that are important. Everything else is just ancillary. Everything else is just deck furniture. Yeah, but it's kind of essential deck furniture because they're not going to be able to do it on their own. You need those. You need that secondary scoring. Oh, I know. I don't mean that he means it's deck furniture and that, like, you don't need it. I think it's deck furniture in that he's not afraid to get rid of something he's had for something that he thinks is going to be a better fit. Yeah. Yeah. He's not. Ray Shiro's biggest downfall when he was with the Penguins was that he became sentimentally attached to so many players. Chris Kunitz, Pascal Dupuy, loved both of them, but they should not have gotten those deals that they got at the ages they got them at. And um, Jim Rutherford really just flies in the face of that. Like, Patrick Hornquist is the only guy that I've seen, and I'm like, yeah, he resigned him. But Patrick Hornquist makes sense. What oh, Patrick yeah. Hornquist brings to this team is so unique. And... I think they have a few guys that they're hoping will develop into that, but they're not ready yet. So they need Hornquist to still be here for a few years. Like maybe Aston Reese? I think that's a czar, or um, I could even see an Anthony Angelo. Okay. And Anthony Angelo is a huge dude, so that would be really physically intimidating for other teams. Oh, I would love that. 6'5", like holy crap, he scored a goal today. Speaking of scoring goals today, Tristan Jari scored the first ever goal in Wilkes-Barre Scranton Penguins history by a goaltender. I heard that. I didn't see it yet, but I heard he scored. Mark oh, Andre Flory must be like seeing that and and, and, and going crazy because he always wanted to score a goal. Now nah, Flory will score one eventually, but it's going to be like some random time. Then he's like, "Oh, that actually worked," you know? Yeah. <laughs> like someone's going to score an own goal, and it's going to be like they'll give it to him. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but um no, Jari scored a goal. It was great. Um and his face and just like the entire team afterwards was fantastic. And it's funny cuz he actually should have scored a goal like last month, a couple weeks ago. He had shot at the empty net and it was going in. One of the players threw their stick at it. Oh no. Which technically is supposed to be an auto goal in right. the NHL. Yeah, yeah. But there was some weird technicality because the player was like on the, because like Tokarski, which was the goaltender, was like still on the ice. So like it ended up just being a penalty and not being an auto goal. Wow. So it's nice that he got one now because like he basically got robbed. Yeah. Yeah, I, I have to check this out. So there's. Three players that are very popular among Penn's fans, and not for a good reason. Um, Broussard, Daniel Sprong, and Jack Johnson. Broussard's hurt. I'm not going to expect, not going to, you know, hopefully he comes back soon. 
But I thought you were going to say three players, and it was going to be Johnson, um, Sprung, and Mata. Well, I... People love to drag Ole Mata. It's like some people think it's their job, I'm pretty sure. Well, <laughs> that... That's another rumor I keep hearing is, is, is Mata next to be traded? Yeah, that's, I think that's funny because a lot of people keep saying that, but everything Rutherford has like done has indicated that that is not something he wants to do. Like he's in love with Ole Mata. I'm not sure why, but I'm not complaining because I, I really enjoy him and I still think that there's something there for him. I, I, you know, maybe he's not going to be what we had originally thought he was going to be. But he's not Jack Johnson. And Jack Johnson, to your point, is bad. He's yeah. he's he's not good. He's not good enough. Maybe he would be good enough on a team that's slower or a team that plays like a Boucher system with like a left wing lock or something that's like just really defensive shell oriented. He is not cut out for this team. I can't believe that they didn't see that. It's not like it's not like Jack Johnson was some, you know, guy from Russia or or whatever or some or some, you know, 19-year-old draft pick or something like that. They've seen him for years. They should know exactly what he's like. Like I, I don't understand how it it just seems like they're they're trying to jam a a square peg in a round hole. Well, sometimes you just really like that square peg and you think you have a square hole, but you don't. Yeah. And that's the thing. It's not like and, like, I feel bad because Johnson didn't, you know, like, he didn't do anything wrong. He has done nothing wrong, and he has busted his butt. Like, he's worked hard. He's tried. Yeah. He just doesn't fit in. And they're playing him with Latang because Latang is, like, a superhuman right now, and he can actually, like, drag Johnson to, like, middle of the road, Corsi 4. Yeah. Yeah, like, it's... <sighs> so, there's really no... There's really no hope. Is that what we're saying for Jack Johnson? I'm not saying there's no hope. Maybe I am saying that. <laughs> I might be saying that. I don't think he's going to be on the team past this year. I don't know how it's going to happen, but he ain't going to be on this team. Or maybe not even by the end of this year. Uh, I don't know. if I don't think he'll be playing by the end of this year, but Ooh. he'll probably still be on the team. You know what I mean? Like oh, Matt yeah. Hunwick was still on the team. He just right. didn't play. Right. So. Um, and I... The thing is, everyone's like, yeah, but they just they signed him to this deal. I'm like, yeah, I know. But, you know, Mike Sullivan, Jim Rutherford trusts Mike Sullivan a lot. Like, he has so much respect for his coach. And you can't blame him because he's a fantastic coach. The problems with this team right now are not to do with this coach. They're to do with these players. And the coach, if he says, you know, I, this player – does not fit, they'll do something about it. Well, speaking of not fitting, Daniel Sprung, it's just not working. It's, mm. it's, it's, is it, I mean, you know, they talk about maybe trading Mata, maybe trading Sprung. These guys are young. This is an older team. You can't just get rid of young people. Mata's 25. He's not young anymore. He's also been in the league for six years. Yeah. So that Mata is like a prime trade candidate because he's middle of the age. He is in the middle of a contract that is cost controlled. Them trading him makes a lot of sense. I just find a hard time believing that Jim Rutherford would do it. That being said, Daniel Sprung hasn't done anything to make himself endeared to this coaching staff. And I, I know there's like some questions about the development staff of the Penguins, and I think they're fair questions to ask after Pouliot, now Sprung, maybe you could put in Sunquist there. You know, they've had players that just haven't worked out, and there have been a few of them. But there's two sides to that. One, none of those players are were supposed to be sure bet NHLers. Even Daniel Sprung wasn't a sure bet NHLer. That's why he went in the second round. But the thing with Daniel Sprung is it just feels like he doesn't know, like him and Jack Johnson both. There are times where I'm like, do you even know what the play is going on around you? Yeah. Like you're in practice. Like you should know. You should at least know like, okay, so 
this happens and I'm supposed to do this. 